lo and behold, breaking news is that they brought their animals with them. Yeah. Is that well, a surprise? I mean, if, uh, a little bit. Why? Uh, have you ever been on a Viking ship for any <laughs> length of time? I, I have. I've been on a recreation of the Gokstad ship. So, there yes. You go. Now put yourself on there and now imagine yeah. a cow and yeah. a pig and a dog and some rats and a cat. And then you're stuck with all those things. Right. That are eating and pooping and peeing all over the place <laughs> for three weeks. <laughs> well, okay. So I'll, I'll just, you know, let the let the, the audience know. I grew up on farms. So the fact that I have to go out and like, you know, shovel poop on a like daily basis was not foreign to me. It's just part of uh, life. So, yeah. I, you know, in the Viking age, it's just part of daily life, you know? Well, you know, we did establish at the beginning that I am a fancy Viking. Yeah, so. right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. On my ship, no animals. We'll have three ships. That one will have animals. Mine will stay clean. <laughs> <laughs> You're hiring Vikings like me to clean up after your animals. Yeah. Terry, you get your ship. I'll give you a ship and you do it over there. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Vikingology. The art and science of the Viking Age. I'm Thing One, CJ Adrian. And I'm the Shield Maiden, Terry Barnes. What happened to Thing Two? See what I, I just went off script there. It was our thing. It was our thing. <laughs> I'm right? Thing Two. <laughs> Ruined, Terry. Ruined. Oh, well, I'll get back on track next time. <laughs> So this episode, we're doing something a little different. No guests today. We do have a guest next week, David Zori, right? Yep, exactly. And that will be a fun episode. But in the meantime, there were some interesting things that came out in the news, and we thought we would cover those things for everyone, do a little discussion, because a lot of these things become sensationalized by social media and the news media. So we're going to take a quick little dive and see what the big ho-hum is. Yeah, Or exactly. not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And some of these, I mean, they're only breaking in the last month. So hot off the presses kind of stuff. But um, before we do that, though, I have a couple of questions for you. Okay. Let's do it. I want to see what kind of Viking you are. <gasps> so I am going to present you with some either or questions. So I want you to make some choices. So I have eight things, I think. Oh, no. Oh. I have choice paralysis already. <laughs> don't, don't get overwhelmed we haven't even started yet <laughs> can i uh can i take a mental health break in the <laughs> mental health room yeah okay so it's just you know a this or that and you tell me which one you prefer okay okay mead or ale mead it's honey mm -hmm. heck yeah thor or odin mm, odin he's more versatile Iron or silver? Uh, silver will buy me iron. It's so practical. I know. <laughs> Winter or summer? A uh, summer. <laughs> Silk or wool? Wool. It'll keep me warm when it's not summer. Beef or skier? Probably beef. <laughs> a troll or an elf in what context <laughs> norse mythology <laughs> no but i mean like are they attacking me or are they my pet like i don't want to troll as a pet right like your friend I'll... your friend your spirit animal your your, your... oh yeah okay Probably... troll or uh... an elf <laughs> oh well then i'd have to like really know myself and know if i'm more of a troll or an elf. i'll go with elf how about that okay <laughs> last one a sword or a rock oh nowadays a rock a rock wow so you're an interesting hybrid type of viking Ooh. because you're a mead lover that's kind of upper class you know that's kind of a wine thing Mm -hmm. Odin, also upper class. That's an elite god, the aristocratic god, the god of the poets. Silver, come on, that's shiny object. Summer, you know, that's kind of that's not harsh. That's easy living. So that's that's upper class also. The only thing now you're throwing me off here with wool. That's a little bit. <laughs> you should, 
if you were going to be a true upper class Viking, you would want silk, I suppose. But that's where your practical side came in. Uh, beef, definitely upper class. It's beef or yogurt. I mean, come on. Beef is yeah. uh, way more expensive to make. Although it mm -hmm. takes the beef to make the uh, yogurt, I will say, right? We need the milk. And then an elf and a rock, those are kind of also probably lower class things, you know? A sword is definitely upper class. So A troll <laughs> is upper class? That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like you know well i'd say you know the elves are kind of hiding out in iceland and the trolls are mostly in norway so we'll go for that part of scandinavia it, in all fairness i would have said sword okay i would have said sword but because of our conversation with rainer oskarsson and william short and the idea <laughs> that the best weapon ever was the rock and you know you right. lose your rock you just get the rocks are everywhere yeah they're a renewable weapon. <laughs> right. You could throw one of those wet stones at them instead of trading for it. You could just kill yeah, someone. Just... <laughs> yeah. But yeah. no, I mean, in all fairness, I probably would have. I, I, I normally would have said, because mm -hmm. a rock, like, really? Like, I could just, just rocks everywhere, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say you're one of those Danes, like a legit Dane. You're like a Viking who's like in the middle. Because, you know, I was going to say you're an Eastern Viking with all that upper class stuff you were picking. But then you kind of went off piste a little bit there with, <laughs> with the elf and the rock and the wool. So, so that brought you a little bit towards the central uh, Viking world. Not to not to stoke any sort of, of modern competitive fire, but are you a insinuating that the swedes are the upper class scandinavians the norwegians are not um yeah that's probably a bad thing <laughs> <laughs> oh boy the comment section the comment section is going to be beautiful for this video all right can we just do like some um what is that uh what's that called when you do the uh um how uh darn it now the word is escaping me but um I see. I would be more of like in the Norwegian camp, you know. Mm -hmm. I'd be more, I'd be more of like the proletariat, <laughs> and not like the bourgeoisie, you know, those upper class people. And mostly because you know they're in contact with that Eastern world, and it's a little bit more blingy over there, I think, than it was out there in the cold North Atlantic, right? Yeah, I mean, well, especially if they're going all the way to visit the Byzantines, right, Constantinople. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, that was that was yeah. incredibly wealthy. Yeah. Totally. And blingy, blingy, as you call it. Exactly. Well, in the actually, Muslim world, they were, they were, were they blingy? Who? The Muslims, like the early. Uh, well, I mean, blingy as far as well, they got all that silver. <laughs> I mean, so they were iconoclastic, so they didn't like leave us lots of pictures right. of them having bling. Yeah, not that kind of stuff, but I mean, they definitely were more um, sophisticated on lots of levels, you know, and their architecture that existed in Spain, like at the time of the Viking Age, you know, in the 8th and 9th centuries, pretty major compared to what the rest of Western Europe was able to accomplish. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, and their literary traditions and their science that was like miles ahead of the Western Europeans, you know, so blingy from that standpoint, as far as sophisticated development, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but actually maybe that's a good segue into the first piece of news because this, this diaspora or this going out of the Scandinavian homelands into various parts of the world, right? I mean, we always think like, oh, the Viking Age, why do we call it that? Well, one of the reasons is because Vikings decide for whatever reason, right, that we hypothesized about in our first episode to just like kind of go out into the world in mass and in, in ways that they hadn't before. But yet now we have this DNA study that's telling us that the reverse was also true during the Viking Age and that there was a lot of inward migration to Scandinavia from other places in the world. And the first question I had is, it's the Viking Age. It's kind of rough. What in the heck do you want to go to Scandinavia for? That's a interesting question. So reading the article, the, the archaeologist in charge or the are they archaeologists? It was, if you're doing genetic testing, it's a multi-team thing, right? Yes, it, multi it was, yeah. Multidisciplinary, yeah. Yeah, multiple authors, yeah. The, the we'll, we'll say the study authors did not care to postulate the reasons for the influx of foreign DNA into Scandinavia at that time, only that it happened. Correct. Right. So, Correct. So we're going to make the leap and start guessing. 
<laughs> right, exactly. You know, because I mean, this is the thing, right? We talked about this before in one of the episodes about how the hard sciences have become more and more of a thing, right, in recent mm -hmm. years, as far as giving us some certainty on stuff. But it also, to a large degree, and especially with stuff like this, I, I think it's giving us a lot of certainty about stuff that we already knew just didn't have, you know, like 100% proof. And so, um, you know, yeah, we know people were moving around a lot at that point in time. And we knew a lot of the sort of population groups that Vikings were intermixing with, right, with the British, Irish versus the Baltic, you know, things like that. And so, um, I mean, the fact that that was happening, I guess, just now is proven. But what does it actually really, what does that mean? Did you may have read in more detail than this. I can't recall. I read it fairly quickly last night. Yeah. Did the study authors say precisely what the provenance of the DNA may have been? Yeah. As far so as they, like who was going where into Scandinavia. Yeah. So they, did they mm -hmm. did they specify these were yeah. from Poland? These were or what would have been yeah. Poland or yeah. what is now modern day Poland? Yep. Yeah. Regionally yeah. speaking, there are no countries back then, so we can't really say, "Oh, it was Poland," and we don't yeah. want people in Poland to confuse. Oh, we had Viking. No, eh, it's just yeah. the land you are now on was once populated by a certain people that then moved. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah, and they did. They broke it down into um, British, British hyphen Irish, so those two kind of coming together, um, and then the Baltic states, which they did include, like Poland in that or modern day Poland. Um, and then there were also like a, 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 a class of others that I had to look at toward, down towards the bottom of the article to kind of like, what are, what are the others? Because it was on a chart and it was like what, what is now like Germany, Hungary, um, you know, kind of in that, uh, the Netherlands, kind of in that more central area. Um, but I mean, it do, they did say, you know, what it potentially shows us is that people were interested in migrating to Scandinavia. And I'm like, why? <laughs> what, what is there? <laughs> that they want. And so, and then the other thing that immediately came to mind to me, which they did kind of mention uh, a bit in it and not in depth, but because they don't know why these people were moving around in that direction. And I'm thinking instantly because of what we know about a lot of the very current scholarship that's going on is like, that is captive people being moved from point A to point B. And then the one thing that I did find to be very interesting is that when they talked about the people who were from the Baltic populations in the East going into Sweden, surprise, surprise, and the people from the British Irish population going into like Norway, surprise, um, that those populations actually, um, at least the evidence that they have tentatively shows that they were female biased, meaning it's more women getting moved into Scandinavia for yeah. whatever reason and so to me well, that just, at least in part smacks of slavery i mean the other thing that they they suggested was you know like christian missionaries um you know which is certainly a possibility and we know that that happened but like how, many of, that, those, yeah. how many of those were there though i mean i can't they weren't like in the hundreds or the thousands right i mean we don't even know that number i don't think well, it's something to be cautious of is, first of all, we only have the bones that we have, right? Right. So the, I don't want to dig into the study's methodology because I don't think I'm particularly qualified to do so, but I, I do feel like I know enough to call into question, for example, one of the genetic, genetic studies are always mired in controversy because the the methodologies we use i mean it's it's a it's an imprecise science best case uh, example is when there was a genetic study done in england to see how many people in the british isles today mm -hmm. carry the genes from the dane law basically this big influx of scandinavians and the results were nil because the anglo-saxon versus danish you know uh genetics are so closely related they were quasi impossible to differentiate from one another mm -hmm. so the study was inconclusive because they just could they couldn't split them they couldn't find enough difference to to split them apart and so if we're talking about an influx into scandinavia even from the british isles i my question my first question would be how did they make that difference right and i don't know because i didn't dig into the the deep yeah. so that but yeah. usually where i like to go first is was the study peer-reviewed yeah. And did anyone did anyone peer reviewing this who is in a position to ask these questions 
ask these questions. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think the study was peer reviewed. It was in the journal Cell, and we will put the links to all of the articles that we're talking about um, in the description so people can check it out for themselves. But they did like a longer term thing going back to like, you know, the late Roman era, basically, you know, say the year, I think, one up to a known shipwreck that happened in the 17th century. So they covered quite a few centuries and we're looking at, you know, how the genomics changed over time based on the surviving skeleton, you know, skeletal material and stuff in those. And so then what they found was that the Viking Age was just this kind of special little, you know, interesting point in the middle of that time span where it appeared that there was a lot more inward migration going to Scandinavia than people had previously thought. And right. that even then after that, and when looking at like modern Scandinavian populations, all of a sudden it's like that that admixture of like, you know, the Baltics going to Sweden and the British Irish going to Norway and all this mixing going on, then all of a sudden that just sort of recedes. And modern Scandinavians don't show hardly any traces of those mixtures from back then so the viking age appears to be this kind of unique time of people moving around i guess would be right good. yeah yeah and, and in in the article at least they mentioned how at, at the end of the viking age that influx appears to have stopped and yes. the genetic exchange stagnated right exactly resulting close, in like yeah. modern scandinavians who don't have a lot of that other stuff from other places in, the, in which their is country. interesting that it's it it correlates so well right with what i like to call the fictitious historians version of the viking age which is like 793 to 1066 but then you know these genetic studies and other archaeological studies are finding that that's not a horrible delineation <laughs> yeah, i mean it's exactly. off by a little bit right right like yes you can't say those dates were the exact start and stop but Roughly speaking, a couple yeah. of decades, not yeah. too far off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I, that, I, then that's so that's why I said at the beginning too, like this, what it essentially can kind of do is take a hard science and sort of show us for sure what we already highly probably knew anyway, or thought right. we knew. So I guess for confirmation for that, it's pretty interesting. Although that being said, I was actually talking with a scholar yesterday and we were talking about this issue of the viking age and because of so much stuff changes over the course of the viking age you know politically and everything else that all of a sudden i was like having this, this brain fart of like who first coined the viking age who who first came up with 8th century to about 1100 because it's wanting one of those things where it's like you just take it as a given because that's what it's always been, right? Like William and Rainer said, right? You know, somebody said it a long time ago and then we always just repeat it. And it's like, well, who made up that that's what it would be? Why did they pick those dates? Because arguably the way things do change over the course of the Viking Age and especially with like, you know, legit European style monarchy towards the end, it's like that in itself could be like a whole other period that doesn't really belong to the first maybe 200 years. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it, it just sort of also, and then the person I was talking to also was like, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where that came from, why we decided on the dates that we did, but we have them. And yeah, the first so, mention. Do we know? The first mention of the word Viking is. Well, that's 19th century. Cause we did talk about that as well. It's like 1807. I have a book here that says it. Yeah. And I'm never going to find it because we're, I, I don't have time to like scour through this, but it's in this book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, do, I do. We do know that, that it's 19th century. It's like 1807. It's like a letter to Queen Anne or something like that. And I always get it wrong because it's like, I'll say 1807. And then Queen Anne wasn't queen until like the 1820s or something. Yeah. Uh, um, so it's, I, I get it wrong, but it's in here. It's in yeah. here somewhere. Yeah. Um. But it's like, it's just the first mention is in this obscure document, royal document in England. Yeah. For the first yeah. mention in English. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Well then, so the other news is kind of related a little bit to this sort of diaspora kind of question, only now going back in the other direction that we're usually talking about, and that's Vikings going out of Scandinavia into other parts of the world. And lo and behold, breaking news is that they brought their animals with them. Yeah. Is that well, a I mean, if, uh, A little bit. Why? Uh, have you ever been on a Viking ship for any <laughs> length of time? I, I have. I've been on a recreation of the Gokstad ship. So, there yes. You go. Now, put yourself on there and now imagine yeah. a cow and yeah. a pig and a dog and some rats and a cat. And then you're stuck with all those things. 
right that are eating and pooping and peeing all over the place <laughs> for three weeks well okay so I'll, I'll just you know let the let the, the audience know i grew up on farms so the fact that i have to go out and like you know shovel poop on a like daily basis was not foreign to me it's just part of okay. life so yeah. i think you know in the viking age it's just part of daily life you know well, you know, we did establish at the beginning that I am a fancy Viking. Yeah, so, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. On my ship, no animals. <laughs> we'll have three ships. That one will have animals. Mine will stay clean. <laughs> <laughs> You're hiring Vikings like me to clean up after your animals. Yeah. Terry, you get your ship. I'll give you a ship and you do it over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should, I, I want to, there's this Instagram channel that I absolutely love. It's this guy. He's from Norway. Yeah. And he just sits there and he goes in Norway and he teaches you something like fictitious about Norway, but it's funny. It's always making fun of the Swedes or something, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd love to send him something like that. Like in Norway, we had two types of ships, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> that's a big deal between the Norwegians and the Swedes. Cause my husband's family's Norwegian and they always would say that. And then they had this little jingle. Um, what was it? A thousand Swedes went through the weeds to capture one Norwegian. And then it was like, and then they get there and then it's like, wait, there's two of them. So they turn back, like as in thousands of Swedes cannot take on two Norwegians. <laughs> uh, like, okay. Yeah. So yeah they got well, that's a, that's, well, you know, they, they have their little beefs and competitions, you know, they definitely do. They definitely I think do. Finland's got the upper hand because you know, what happened in world war or was it, is the Russians tried to invade Finland like three times and failed yeah. and it yeah. was overwhelming odds. And I, I mean, that's a, that's a cool yeah. story, Yeah. but they're technically not Scandinavian. So we'll leave them in. Yeah. They are yeah, now, yeah, but yeah, like, they're not, yeah. they're not Viking, you know, like yeah, they yeah, exactly. were their own the Finno-Ugric group. Let's not get into that right now. Yeah, yeah, no, let's not get into that. <laughs> yeah, let's go back to the animals. The animals. Animals. So this is the analysis of bone remains. And this was then finding that there were burials that contained primarily horses, pigs, and dogs. Hmm. And so is that unique for what we know about Viking Age people, Scandinavian Viking Age people? I don't think so. We, we, we've known for a while that they had animals on the ships. Yeah. I think the, what the, what this study was pointing out is we assume the diaspora, the, uh, the outward expansion was people and the yeah. inward expansion was uh, movable goods, right? right? Something you could carry, including animals. Including so people. we, we figured they went to these places, grabbed these things, brought them home. Now we're realizing they brought some with them from Scandinavia out and then those animals mix with the populations. So that genetic exchange, yeah. the outward yeah. genetic exchange was not just for humans, but also for animals. Right. Which it, in other time periods, we know this was true as well, right? Correct. The yes. uh, In other expansions of, of populations, they brought animals with them. Yep. There was a study years ago about cats, how cats all around Europe all have genes that date back to cats that were from scandinavia yeah and the thought is scandinavians had cats on their boats yeah. to catch rats and then they brought those cats elsewhere cats of course being cats they don't listen to you so you land somewhere the cat leaves yeah. he's not coming back yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we also know the vikings wore cat fur so cats were multi-purpose animals <laughs> Sorry. wait hang on Sorry. hang on hit the hit the pause button i didn't know this <laughs> Yeah. They wore yeah. cat fur. Where's this from? Yeah, I can't remember the source, but I definitely know I've read this. Um I mean, and they wore all kinds of furs. So sure. I, I mean that's that. it's not yeah. unimaginable, but just the idea yeah. that you know the what here's the wealthy chieftain coming up yep. with my thing, you know. That's oh yeah, it. it's it's made of all of my wife's cats because she really <laughs> pissed me off yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> now we're really gonna get banned from the internet <laughs> talking about this. Um <laughs> But I think one of the things that the article was pointing out, too, is this idea of, you know, obviously, when you look at maybe like a pig or even a cow or something, it's like, okay, we know that, you know, there's 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 a food purpose there also. I mean, it's not like they're bringing their pet potbelly pig or something. Right. But when you look at things like horses, I mean, obviously, horses are functional, too. But horses are kind of, I think, in a liminal space between, you know, companion and just complete, you know, farm animal you know and that's their only purpose and then there's like dogs and cats and then like okay so are are, are vikings the kinds of people who are these animals practical and functional or or do they are they people who have pets basically you know as like companions and 
I mean, obviously, how many ways do we have to answer this question? I don't know if, how many references there are to this kind of thing in the sagas and stuff, but it always, to me, sort of, um, I mean, we can't just go out and just sort of say things, right, as responsible scholars and stuff, even though in the back of your mind, you're like, my God, it's just common sense. They were human beings. Of course, they had cats and dogs that were pets. Do you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's what, you know, part of the article was about, so... Um, and they know the interesting thing too, the here with the hard sciences as well, is that they're they're looking at it as these animals are from Scandinavia. Cause like what you're saying, you know, well, the animals could get out or whatever happens. It's like, oh, how do you know these animals that were buried with these people were actually Scandinavian animals that came with them? And they did the testing of the strontium isotope on the bones, which they can also do on teeth. And the and because of that being a naturally occurring thing in like, you know, rocks and the ground and whatever, and then whatever grows in that rock, you know, and then the animals eat it anyway, it gets into their system. And so you can figure out where not only animals, but people came from based on, you know, food and also the water source that they're drinking right. when they're younger, right? So they were able to positively mm -hmm. identify these animals as having come from Scandinavia. So I guess the big deal was just like, yeah, wow, the Vikings brought their pets. But right. Well, and not to be overgeneralized, right? Because different Vikings had different activities. Some right. left to raid, others left specifically to colonize. And in Great Britain, we know that they established the Dane law. So that is not surprising that they picked up their whole farm and yeah. moved it to England versus right. yeah. whoever was raiding in France, they made no attempt really to colonize. And, and the reason we think that is because they didn't leave behind any sort of legacy of place names, the that same genetic legacy that we see in Great Britain. Right. We don't see that as well. We know from the sources that once the Vikings were expelled from Western France, the areas that they were controlling were derelict. They'd not been converted into flourishing trade centers as they had been in England. So right. different areas of the world experienced the Viking Age quite differently. Correct. So we can say with this study in particular, they studied animals in England. So we can say from the Anglo-centric right. point of view, this was true. Correct. Uh, perhaps, in, well, of course, in Iceland, that very likely true, right? Yes. Uh, taking their animals and everything. But then in France or Spain or even Germany, Right. Uh, right. Much less, much less the case. Right. Right. You Maybe can just Normandy? buy those I don't things. Know. Yeah. yeah. You can just buy those animals while you're there or steal them, most likely. Right. right. Or the Swedes moving east. Correct. Where they bring their animals all the way east. Although yeah. we know that their experience differed significantly insofar as the eastward expansion quickly turned into a sort of power grab. Right. Right. With the establishment of the Kievan Rus. Uh, the city states of Novgorod, Kiev, right? So they, so they, that we, we, in comparison with the West, we, we can't really even compare the two in terms of how they unfolded because they're so different. Correct. Right? Yeah. So this study is very focused. It's, it's yeah. Vikings brought animals to England. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and like you say, I mean, yeah, definitely the settlement thing is, is an issue. Um, I mean, but also I think it's interesting for, you know, and maybe many of our audience will know this if you're Viking enthusiasts and stuff is that, um, especially in the pre-Christian -pre period of Scandinavia during the Viking age, animals of all kinds played important roles in, you know, the spirit world and, and stuff for them as well. And, and it's very common in many of the burials that we have excavated back home in Scandinavia that we find lots of various types of animals. There's, you know, the horses that are in this study, there's the dogs, the cats, various kinds of birds, you know, and, and it's, and so it, it's, this is not an unusual finding. I guess the unusual finding is that they actually just brought them with them. But even from the mythological standpoint, right? You know, I mean, Odin has ravens, Odin has wolves, um, Odin has a horse with eight legs. Uh, Freya has cats. Freya has cats and a boar. Uh, that are not yet skinned. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Thor has goats. <laughs> yeah, he does. And so, you know, there's a lot of, and then we know that from cult sites as well, where there's animal sacrifice that's going on, you know, that have to be like small game animals, beer, or beer, <laughs> that too, but bear <laughs> and elk, um, you know, and so, yeah, the animal world and, you know, sort of the Viking world are like this. So it's not, I think, an unusual thing that these animals would have been with those people. But I guess, right. again, just like with the other study, there's, now we know for sure, right, mm -hmm. that they were coming from Scandinavia. So 
All right. Well, that was interesting. The other thing, okay, my shirt, I got on my, my runic alphabet here. Although to be fair, uh, this is the elder Futhark, which was not in use during the Viking age. But the thing is that there's a rune stone now that was found. Um, and it's a Norwegian rune stone, which is a little bit unusual because most of the rune stones are from Sweden. But so, uh, and for those of you in the audience who don't know, so rune stones in the Viking age typically were stones that were commissioned to be made. They were raised uh, in memory of people. They were not gravestones or tombstones like we think of in the modern era because they weren't always, uh, mostly were not at the site of like where somebody was buried, but they were more um, put on, along public ways so that people, I mean, they were, I always tell my students, they're like the billboards of the Viking age. It's just like, hey, CJ, it was a very fancy Viking who went to the East and made it all the way to Constantinople, but he died. And so we just yeah, they're want more to... like monument stones, right? Yeah, so yeah. Remembrance, so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so they have these kind of very short, usually inscriptions on them uh, about various people. But so this rune stone was was found dating to somewhere uh, like between, say, the year one and 250 AD. So that's very early. Um, because it, that predates the Viking Age by, well, at the, at the outside date of 250 AD, that predates the Viking Age proper by like 500 years. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's, it's and we know that these runic alphabets like this one, the Futhark, um, are not unique to the Viking Age. The Viking Age, Scandinavians just used a particular version of it, but it's from an older Germanic, probably, possibly, Possibly even Italian. Um, I I read that it you know you know runes could even have come potentially from Latin, uh, or also from uh, Etruscan, which is kind of in central Italy. There were you know, what we know as Tuscany is now. But anyway, so this is an older mm -hmm. alphabet uh, that the Germanic tribes then, because of course the Germanic tribes right had a lot of contact with the Romans, uh, you know, dealt them a few blows a few times. Eventually they dealt them the final blow in the fifth century. Um, and so this is kind of a new- Sort thing. of. Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but this is kind of a new thing just again, because of the uh, the fact that it's so much older than, you know, right. the other rune stones that we have. Um, and they, they, they can make out some of the letters on the inscription, but of course to, you know, modern people, it's sort of, gobbledygook because it's just a string of letters that kind of spell kind of something but not sure what and then i i guess maybe all of the inscription is not legible so there's that problem as well but if you want to see the stone and you're in that part of the world it is currently on display at the museum of cultural history in oslo and we'll be there until later this month so you can go check it out and we don't know we don't know what it says no idea no no no, nope. mm -hmm. so but we'll post the um we'll post again the article in the description here and they've got the the string of the few letters that they have been able to make out but and there's some attempts that sort of could be this could be this or could be this and this and this <laughs> don't know yeah don't well know. thankfully there are uh, people much smarter than me working on these things and they'll they'll figure it out and then disseminate the information and I'll yeah I'll yeah. be the better for it so thank you yeah yeah there you go. <laughs> I think it's just an interesting thing with a lot of these stories we're talking about is it kind of stretches our idea a little bit of, you know, again, this this finite thing known as the Viking Age. But of course, you know, there's there was lots that came before it that bled into it and caused it, you know, as well as what was, was after it, you know. So it's all just part of this sort of flowy continuum of the human story, I think. Right. I mean, if we if I could boil it down into a more contemporary pop culture way basically mm. the viking ages episodes four through six of star wars and then there's a before trilogy and there's an after trilogy and they all blend in but we all know the the first one's the best one right right <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah yeah the most well, exciting one it's the one that made the most sense anyway <laughs> yeah well and as a historian I'm, I'm you know i'm gonna have to like as i always tell my students like you know these things build on each other you know right. it's like something something happens and then it you know invariably affects what comes next <laughs> right it's well as uh, sigmund freud penned an article or a paper that i had i was made to read in a psychology class back in college it was really interesting but he used the city of rome as an example for how the mind builds on itself too 
mm-hmm. all of our previous experiences are yeah. the base and then we keep building on top on top so he uses the the city of rome which if you dig down underneath modern rome you'll right. find three four five six different iterations of the city right. buried beneath that they just built right on top of right. to make the modern city so it's same thing with history there's it's a continuum and then it's just constantly building on itself. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and actually last week in our uh, episode with Sig about housing, I mean, we mentioned a little bit of that too, where we know the Vikings were just building right on top of those Pictish settlements in Scotland. Oh, yeah. So, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, these are repurposing people, right? It's like, why rebuild the wheel if you don't have to? Doesn't it, you know? But also Freud, you know, he used the iceberg as a metaphor too for... yeah. Um, you know, underneath the water is all those dark and bad thoughts that you probably have that you want to stay under the water. <laughs> I'm more of a young guy, you know, yeah. the shadow. Yeah, it's right. not bad. It's not good or bad. It's just there. It's just there. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. I can get on board. Yeah. Okay. The last thing um, we have, this is hot off the presses even just today. I just saw it um, before we came on air and that is... Ooh. Um, medievalist.net is having a new feature um, so you can check out that link in the description for something that they're going to kind of sounds like do a little bit of a deeper dive a couple of times a month Um, so that's going to be interesting just for medievalists out there but the very first installment is about Norse music during the Viking age and Mm so there'll be some stuff posted there where people can learn more about that, which I think is interesting because that is one of the aspects of the Viking age that, you know, it's, it's kind of gone right to the mists of time. We don't know really what thing. I'm, this is a thing I'm always telling my students, like try to engage with the past with all of your senses. Okay. So we can use our eyes to look at artifacts and read things. Um, but you know, the rest of your senses, I mean, it's a difficult thing. You know, we don't know what it smelled like. Oftentimes we probably wouldn't want to know what it smelled like. Mm, Uh, We don't know. We can only approximate what it would taste like. I mean, I make Icelandic skier, but you know, I'm not living in the Viking age, so it's not exact, but okay. Maybe, you know, we, but the sound part of it, you know, I mean, we just don't, um, we, we don't have that. And it's, it's such recent history that we have the ability to record sound, that so much of what the past sounded like is just gone. Uh, so anyway, music. Yeah, is- and there are people out there actively trying to use their senses to engage with the past. Yeah, that's there's the living history people. I mean, we have to be careful because a lot of it's woo. Right. 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 It's just it's we we don't have a clue. Music is one of those things. There are a lot of folk bands out of Europe, even North America who claim to be making, you know, Viking music, and they're using instruments that may have been used at the time. We do have, you know, the archaeological record does have a couple of instruments. Right. So music was, was a thing. Right. Just what did it sound like? We we don't have a clue. There's no Uh, sheet music from the Viking age. (laughs) No, there's not. I feel like I saw somebody, there was something where they were able to bring back a song from like a really long time ago before recording was possible because of how, I can't, I'd have to dig it up, but there was, there was something that they gave him just enough of a clue to be able to make it up more convincingly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah but as, I, as, so as a historical fiction author, I mean, that is literally my job, right? right? Where I can take, I take all of these things and I learn and I keep studying and so forth. That only gets me so far because in telling the story, I do have to engage with all of the reader's senses. Yep. You know, when somebody walks into a room, you know, what was the feeling? What was the smell? What were the sounds, you know, and and paint this picture of what it would have been like. And most of it I'm just making up. But a lot yeah. of it, you know, as a human being, I can approximate at least some, you know, from, yeah. you know, like walking into like visiting an old longhouse, for example, that's a reconstruction. And you can get in there and you can smell the wood. You can smell the earth. You know, if they, if they did it right and they have the, the floor is made is ash and they have a fire going, fire, and it's kind yeah. of smoky. Yep. And then and then, of course, I've smelled bad people in my life. So I know that there are <laughs> smells that people emanate, especially yeah. meat eaters, people who eat a lot of meat, people yeah. who eat a lot of plants smell a little bit differently. Like, so these are things yeah. that just as a human being, I know from yeah. life experience. However, right. I also have to be really cautious because right. there's just so much that we don't know. Yep. So, and I'll never know what it's like to be a Viking. So I'll never be able to share with my audience exactly what it felt like to be a Viking. You know what I mean? Yes. But I can approximate. I can kind of pay I, what I like to call it's like the literary pantomiming, right? 
Yeah. And, um, and as long as the story is there, right. And that's just, you know, a lot of criticism I get on my books is that dialogues are too contemporary or this and that. And it's like, well, I am writing for a modern audience, right? Right, right. It has and to I, be and you and I talked about this before, like that movie, The Northman. Yeah. They went full Viking. Right. Right. You never go full Viking. It's trying. unrelatable. <laughs> yeah. Everybody hated it. Even the historians. They're like, yeah. I don't, what? This was so weird because they tried to go full Viking. Yeah. Right. And uh, and that's that's a, a riff off of that movie, the you know never go full yeah. R word. I, I yeah. want to watch out for the PC police. Yeah, right. When, <laughs> since when have I cared about the PC police? Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, never that way he's like never go full. You know, so that, that's just it. They went full Viking. If you do that, you yeah. alienate the modern audience because we just can't identify with that world. It's so foreign to us. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's fantasy, and it's fun to yeah. fantasize about, you know, being just sort of this badass warrior person or whatever. But when it actually comes to like the nitty gritty reality of what it's like to maybe kill somebody or whatever, I mean, very few mm -hmm. human beings in the modern world know what that feels like. And most people, when they're confronted with it, are like, okay, yeah, you know, you're right. I really would rather not know. Yeah. 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 So. I, it's funny. A few years ago, I I met this gentleman who, and actually, he used some of what he told me because he was like a, he was a former special ops he couldn't he wasn't like supposed to tell me exactly like his all like um super secret stuff that he did but anyway he did a lot of stuff and he was former military paramilitary anyway and he uh really nice guy in the gym but every so often like we'd be talking and he would come out with something right and and that would give me pause where it's immediately i knew he had that experience and one of them was yeah, what was it that he said? Oh, I'm spacing out. It's something about like it was taking another life and how like you know after a while he, he's like the what did what did he say? It's in one of my books. I'll have to pull up the dialogue. But it, it we were just talking in the gym, just talking about this and that and da 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 da. And then just he just kind of comes out with this line where I'm just like, <laughs> uh, dude, you're scaring me now. <laughs> right, and he's like, oh, it's fine. Don't worry about it. You know, like oh. This guy was great. I mean, he was built like a brick house. He had long flowing hair, yeah. right? And like just long straight, you know, he, he looked like the lion from the lion, the witch in the wardrobe, you know, <laughs> right around the gym. Super nice guy, really goofy, funny, but like just every so often you'd see that other side of him where you're like, Ooh, you have experience that terrifies me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, well, and so yeah. people can check this new thing out. I suppose North music shouldn't terrify us too much, right? <laughs> Maybe we no, want to, I you know, what drumming sounds like or whatever and that kind of thing. So, um, and then, so should we, so we tease a little bit, then what we're going to talk about next week? Yeah, let's dive in. So, you know, I mean, this will be, this will be right up your alley because we've already established what a fancy Viking you are. Oh, um, this will be a conversation with Dr. David Zori of Baylor University, who is specializing in or is a specialist in the Viking Age, but also um, has been working on a dig in Italy, so medieval Italy. So he's kind of got an interesting sort of, you know, a foot in a couple of different medieval camps there. But he is going to talk to us about what it means to be a chieftain in the Viking Age and what kinds of reciprocal relationships were important for those men to have with the other men in their community so that they could stay in power and then how important it was to hold you know big feasts in the mead hall and all of that that you see you know the fancy stuff on tv um and so stay tuned for that because that should be pretty interesting for everyone out there who aspires to be a viking chieftain mm, yes the aggressive social hierarchy of being a chieftain I always think of it like in Star Trek terms of like being, you know, the Klingons. Yeah. Where if your direct superior isn't doing what he should be doing, the next in command can kill him and take his spot. You know, yeah. I always think, yeah. I think of maybe Vikings being kind of like that. We'll see. I'll ask. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it I, was, it was I, more I, rigid than that. It was more, <laughs> but and, you know, they had their oaths, they had their, they kind of their oaths that they stuck by and stuff. But like, I think, yeah. I, I don't know. I love bringing Star Trek had some interesting ideas on warrior cultures. And that, that one always strikes me as kind of, funny <laughs> that's interesting um because i always think mafia boss so um, yeah you know you, you just sort of, you know yeah he's godfather so lately i think more of the mark sapolsky the guy who wrote why zebras don't get ulcers yeah. and he studies baboon troops and the social interactions between oh, yeah. you know the social hierarchy of baboons which is are not 
all that dissimilar to human social hierarchies. Yeah. And they show he shows that the the quote unquote, you know, alpha, the top, the top baboon who's in charge, has the highest levels of cortisol and stress hormones, etc. So it's a it's an incredibly stressful position to be in. Right. And then and then they just torture the people beneath them. But then actually you the ones that like get bullied all the time at the bottom of the food chain don't necessarily have higher stress hormones than the people at the top because they're not worried about having their position taken over. It's really interesting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It would be fun to get those two together <laughs> <laughs> in a dream world, maybe one day. Yeah. Well, that's always the way it is too. Right? I mean, you and I are both American. I mean, well, you're half American, but <laughs> American culture is all about the winner. Right. And it's like, mm-hmm. you know, everybody's always sort of climbing to the top and wants to be the person at the top, whether it's, you know, it, whatever world it's in sports or what have you and then but they you never sort of think about like what it's like when you get there and how terrible mm-hmm. it is actually to be the one at the top that everyone now wants to knock off and you know take your spot and all of that so always seems like maybe it's better to be climbing to the top than it is to get to the top <laughs> it's it's healthier to not be at the top yeah <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so anyway right. so that will uh, that'll be next next week well, and that brings a conclusion to our segment, Vikings in the News. All the news that's fit to print. Ooh, I was supposed to, probably not supposed to say that because I think that's a New York Times line. <gasps> no, oh, that's well. okay. Fair we use. Edit. We can edit that out. <laughs> 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 okay, good. Okay, well, well, we'll see you all next week. See you then. Mm-hmm.